All right, so chemistry 3102, this is our next lab. Experiment 3.4 A and B, um, solubility and recrystallization. We're gonna be recrystallizing an organic solid. In part A, we're gonna be using data that was collected during a previous semester. So we're just gonna be discussing that data in class. And I mean, in the lab with your lab instructor, and then you're physically going to be doing part B. That is the actual recrystallization of the organic solid. So if you're wondering what exactly is recrystallization and what are we doing in this lab? Well, just like the melting point lab where we gave you an unknown and that unknown number was written on your fume hood sash, in this lab, you're going to recrystallize one of these three compounds that are shown in this box here, trans still being nine fluorinone or benzoic acid. So on your fume hood sash, you're gonna see the names of one of these compounds, transstilbene, nine fluorinone or benzoic acid. And then you are going to recrystallize one of these three compounds, not all three, only one of them. And you're gonna recrystallize it using one of the solvents that's in the box down here below. So the options for recrystallizing solvents are hexane, toluene, acetone, ethanol, and water. And if you're wondering, how am I gonna know what to recrystallize my organic compound in? You're gonna use the data from experiment 3.4a, which again was collected during the previous semester. And that is gonna allow you to choose an appropriate solvent to recrystallize your compound. Something you wanna be thinking about right away is when you look at the structures of these molecules, you would wanna ask yourself, are these molecules polar, nonpolar, or moderately polar? So those are things that you want to think about before coming to the lab. And I'll tell you why um, as we progress through the slides today. Now, before you come to the lab, and hopefully before you came to this lab lecture, you took a look at the slides and you took the time to read Technique F. It will not take um, very long, but there is a little bit of text. You need to read the introduction theory the whole discussion about solvent, which is directly related to the possible solvents that we have here. Also, the textbook talks about the whole technique of recrystallization, gives you some good tips. Um, there's also information about filtration, suction filtration, and tips with respect to that as well. So there's a lot of moving parts to recrystallization. There's a lot to know about filtration. And so be sure to read all of these parts here before coming to the lab, okay? And your instructor will definitely know if you took the time to read those, if she or he decides to ask you a question about recrystallization and filtration. Well, if you're wondering what recrystallization is, it has something to do with crystals, doesn't it? Because organic compounds that are solids at room temperature exist as crystals. So recrystallization is an important technique. Why? Because it's one of those commonly used methods to purify organic compounds. If we do a reaction in the lab, or if we do an extraction in the lab, oftentimes the organic compounds that are isolated from extraction or from a reaction are going to be impure. And so chemists have devised uh, ways to purify compounds. And recrystallization is one of the best ways to purify organic compounds. Um, it also seems to be a challenging technique for many students, okay? Normally, if we were having a lab practical, if there was no pandemic, um, the recrystallization would be part of your lab practical. However, again, since we are in a global pandemic, there will be no lab practical this semester. But I hope that makes you realize that we consider this a very important technique, and that's why we would normally test our students on it in the lab practical. What is recrystallization? Well, in a nutshell, solid organic compounds that are synthesized or um, generated through extraction in the laboratory need to be purified. Okay, so if we have an impure compound, what do we do? We're going to recrystallize it from an appropriate solvent. When we recrystallize something, the process is a slow process. Now, that doesn't mean we need to take the whole day to do a recrystallization, but there is a part of the recrystallization process um, when we look at the actual steps of the lab, that is a slow process, and I'm going to go over that. The process of recrystallizing something, again, is slow. However, 
you might think, well, if I take something that's a homogeneous, or uh, something that's homogeneous in the liquid phase, and I get a solid to form from that, isn't that precipitation? I did that in general chemistry when I did uh, metathesis reactions or double replacement reactions. You took two um, homogeneous mixtures and you mixed them and you generated a solid. That's precipitation, okay? That is a rapid and non-selective process and you cannot use precipitation to purify an organic compound. Anyhow, let's talk a little bit about solubility. Hopefully all of you remember this old chestnut from general chemistry. When you talked about intermolecular forces, you would have talked about solubility of compounds. And you probably learned this rule that like compounds dissolve other like compounds. So that means if we have a polar compound, for example, it's going to dissolve in a polar solvent. If we have something that's nonpolar, it's probably going to dissolve in a nonpolar solvent. And if we have something that's weakly polar, it's going to dissolve in a weakly polar solvent. Okay? So what does that tell you? You need to understand when a molecule is polar so that you can recognize if your solute is polar and if your solvent is polar, right? You have to be able to recognize when something is nonpolar, right? This all goes back to intermolecular forces, right? Dipole moments, um, molecular geometry, things of that ilk. These are things that come up a lot in the organic chemistry lab. So what you're going to do in this lab, I'm going to skip these two slides here, and I want to go to what constitutes a good solvent for a crystallization. Right, because if you go back a couple of slides, ah, maybe I'll go over the overview with you too. If you're confused and if you didn't read the, the um, textbook before coming here, I'll, I'll just kind of go over it in a nutshell and I'm going to repeat most of these steps later on. But the overview of what you're going to be doing in the lab is this. You're going to be assigned an organic compound, 9-fluorinone benzoic acid or transtilbene. You're going to dissolve that organic compound in boiling solvent. So you're going to select the appropriate solvent, and you're going to have that solvent boiling, and then you're going to take that hot boiling solvent and add it to your solid organic compound. What's that going to do? If you choose the appropriate solvent, it's going to cause your organic compound, your solid compound, to dissolve. Right? If we, um, you're going to make a solution, and then what you're going to do is you're going to take that hot solution and you're going to cool it slowly, and when it cools slowly crystals will form, and those will be the crystals of the purified organic product, okay? After the solution and purified crystals have returned to room temperature, so once they're cooled, once they've cooled to room temperature, you put the beaker that they're in in an ice bath, and what that does is it just forces more crystals out of the solution. Then you collect the crystals by vacuum filtration. And I'm going to go over all these steps in detail. Then you're going to purify them by or rinse them uh, with um, some cold solvent, then you air dry them for about 15 minutes, and then you're gonna take the melting point. So you're gonna take 15 minutes to dry the compound, and then you're gonna have to take the melting point range before you leave the lab. So that's really the overview, and I'll go over all these steps again. Now, when it comes to selecting a solvent, I told you that we're gonna use data that was collected from a previous semester. Um, to help us in our choice of the appropriate solvent for our organic compounds that we wish to purify. Now, how are we going to know what makes a good recrystallization solvent? Well, I have it summarized here. And there's some pretty interesting bullet points here. The first one is it should dissolve all of the compound when the solvent is hot. Remember two slides ago, I said you're going to take hot boiling solvent and you're going to dissolve your compound. Okay. If the, if the solvent is boiling, it's hot, and it should dissolve all the compounds. Okay, good. Now, conversely, when the solvent is cold, it shouldn't dissolve any of your compounds. Now, why would that be? Because if your compound, your organic compound, your solid, if it was soluble in the recrystallization solvent or soluble in the solvent at room temperature, then the compound wouldn't crystallize. Okay? Another one is that the solvent should show differential solubility for the compound and impurities. What does that mean? It means that the compound should recrystallize when the solvent reaches room temperature. However, what we want is a solvent 
is chosen so that the impurities will remain in solution. So that when we filter off the pure compound, those impurities are going to stay in that solution and get washed away. Also, the solvent should have a lower boiling point than the melting point of the compound because otherwise you're going to risk just melting the compound in the solvent. And what you want to do is dissolve the compound in the solvent. Also, it needs to have a relatively low boiling point. So somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 100 degrees Celsius. The reason why is because if it's got a boiling point higher than 100 degrees Celsius, then the vapor pressure is so low that it can be really difficult to get the solvent out of the compound. And it takes a long time to dry it. Okay. Lastly, there's a few points here. It should be cheap, non-toxic, non-reactive, and hopefully odorless. Okay. All right. Now, is there any recrystallization solvent that meets all of these criteria? Well, probably, depending on the situation. But this would be the sort of the holy grail if it melt, if it met all of these characteristics. Now, going back to the solute solvent solubility, we said that the solute, which is the solid. Right, that's the one that's present in a lower quantity. Right, the, the solute should be insoluble in cold, cold solvent, but soluble in hot solvent. Right, if you were to take your nine fluorinone transphilbene or benzoic acid and put it in your recrystallizing solvent at room temperature, it should not dissolve the organic compound, it should not dissolve the solid. However, when you heat it up, it should dissolve it. Right. And it should have a steep solubility versus temperature curve. If you look at scenario B, the problem with solvent B here with respect to our solubility temperature curve is that not only is B or not only is the solute soluble in B at high temperature, it's also soluble in it at low temperature. And that's not good. We want the solute to be insoluble in the solvent at low temperature. So that's not a good one. If you look at A, the problem with A is that the compound is still insoluble. The solute is still insoluble in the solvent, even at high temperature. And so the best choice here would be C. Why? If you follow the curve for C, we can see that the compound is going to have a low solubility at a low temperature but it's going to have a high solubility at a high temperature. And that's what we want. Insoluble in a cold solvent, but soluble in a hot solvent. Now, what about these solvents? As an organic chemistry student, it is your duty to know some solvents. Now, the solvents that I had a few slides ago were what? Hexane, toluene, acetone, ethanol, and water. So we had hydrocarbons, we had, an aram, or a, we had an alkane, we had an aromatic, we had a ketone, an alcohol, and we have water. Well, if we list those solvents or functional groups in solvents, I guess, in order of decreasing polarity, so order is going like this from water being most polar to an alkane being least polar, okay, you can see that. We go from water to things like alcohols, which are capable of hydrogen bonding, have strong dipoles, to carbonyls like aldehydes and ketones, followed by esters, ethers. Then we drop down to hydrocarbons, first aromatics, and then alkanes. Well, this is not a comprehensive list, but it is a good summary of the types of solvents that we see in chemistry 3102. I would also recommend that you look at table, table 1C, um, yeah, I think it's 1CF, which has a list of solvents as well as their dielectric constants. So dielectric, dielectric constants. Now, I'm not going to reteach dielectric constants here, but if you're in chemistry 3101, that's something that we looked at way back in chapter one, the dielectric constant. And we saw that the higher the dielectric constant, the more polar the molecule. And so if you go back to the list of solvents, we go way back here in the slides, one of the things you're going to have to do in your pre-lab is rank these solvents in order of polarity. All you have to do is look at the dielectric constants and compare them. Water has the highest dielectric constant, so it's going to be the most polar. 
and hexane has the lowest dielectric constant, and so it's going to be the least polar. I'm going to let you look at the dielectric constants for the other three so that you can rank them in the correct order. All right. Something that you heard me mention was filtration. I said not only do you have to know about recrystallization when you read about the techniques, you also have to understand what filtration is. Well, why would we use filtration? First and foremost, filtration is used to separate your pure solid okay, from soluble impurities that remain in the solution from which it was recrystallized. Okay, So remember, I told you that a good recrystallization solvent is going to have different solubilizing capabilities for the product that you wish to recrystallize and the impurities. And so if your product comes out recrystallized and the impurities remain in solution, you can simply dump them over a filter paper on a funnel and filter off the impurities. They're going to come washed away in the solvent that comes through. We call that the filtrate, or sometimes it's called the mother liquor. Another purpose of filtration is to remove solid impurities remaining, um, uh, I should say, um, remaining before recrystallizing a sample from a solvent. This thing should say before. So this is something that we do. If you dissolve your solid and you end up with little flecks or chunks that are left behind that are not the desired compound, you can remove those using filtration, okay? We're not going to run into that situation. It's something that I doubt we're going to have to do in this lab. I don't remember doing it in this lab, at least. Anyhow, now the two types of filtration that an organic chemistry student has to know are gravity filtration and vacuum filtration. In this lab, we're going to use vacuum filtration, but again, you should know both types. For gravity filtration, what we use is our force that pushes our Solution through the filter paper is going to be gravity. Okay, so no vacuum filter required whatsoever. And in the lab, all of you have seen the filter paper that we use to put in the TLC chamber. Well, that filter paper is more correctly or uh, usually used as a filter paper to filter off, filter off solids. And you can take those filter papers and you can make what's called a filter cone like this. Okay, so you just make a little cone out of it, or you can make what's called a fluted filter which has like little creases that go all the way around them. Another option for gravity filtration is just to simply take a little tiny pasture pipette and stick the tiny, a tiny little piece of cotton. And so if you take your solution that has little flecks in it, so I guess it would be kind of a suspension maybe, if you filter through a piece of cotton wool or what we call a cotton plug sometimes, whatever um, solid impurities that are present in the solution or, or suspension, so to speak, um, those will be filtered off. So you have a nice um, homogeneous solution to, um, to, uh, to, to allow to crystallize. Now, vacuum filtration is more of greater interest to us because it's used in our lab. Why do we use it? Well, there's a bunch of reasons, but it's quicker than gravity filtration because you have the added bonus that you have a vacuum sucking on um, the filter funnel, okay? The types of funnels that are used for vacuum filtration are either Buchner funnels or Hirsch, Hirsch funnels. This is a Buchner funnel here. The reason we don't use Buchner funnels in our labs, they are used in some undergraduate labs. I used them when I was an undergraduate, is because Buchner funnels are used to filter off larger volumes of solids. Um, and so, since we're trying to get away from using large quantities of materials in an undergraduate lab, the Hirsch funnel is much better for, you know, smaller samples. And so we use it in our microscale techniques lab. So this is the kind of funnel that you're going to use right here. This funnel is called a Hirsch funnel. It's got kind of a um, uh, conical shape to it. Okay. And you've probably seen it in your drawer uh, in, in the lab. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the recrystallization theory. You've heard me say things like dissolve your organic compound, your solid, in a hot solvent, and then you allow it to cool, and the compound is going to recrystallize, and somehow it's just going to magically be purer. 
Now, why would that be? Well, first of all, let's talk about dissolving your organic compounds. It says solids are going to be more soluble in hot solvents than cold solvents in equal or comparable volumes. I'm sure you're all aware of that. Let's say you take some sodium chloride and you put it in water and you keep pouring sodium chloride in so that you reach the saturation point, so that you cannot put any more sodium chloride in solution. Well, you can heat that sodium chloride solution up, and what that will do is it will allow you to add more sodium chloride into the solution. Okay, you can make a more saturated solution at a higher temperature. And in organic chemistry, we see the same trend, that for most compounds, solubility increases with temperature. Okay, good. So that's why we dissolve our solute in hot boiling solvent, because we make a saturated solution. And in that saturated solution, look, we've got both the compound that we want and impurities. Now, again, we want to separate these two, right? We want to separate the desired compound from the impurities. We're trying to get rid of the impurities. So when we set the solution aside to cool, the, the impurities are going to remain in the solvent and the desired compound is going to recrystallize out. Okay? And the slower the cooling, the greater advantage you take of the thermodynamics and the better crystals are going to be formed. So when you set your hot solution down inside your humid, do not touch it. Okay, don't touch it. Don't move it. Don't touch it. You can look at it, but don't touch it, okay? Because if you move it, that's not a good thing. Now, you might be wondering, well, why would this be? I'm not sure if I understand. Well, let's think about an organic compound. So if this is an organic compound here, this is a solid crystal, but you can see that it's got impurities inside the crystal. And those impurities are encapsulated by the compound that we want to have in the pure, um, that we want to purify all around it. So how are we going to remove these impure compounds from our solid crystal? Well, again, first, you're going to add the minimum amount of hot solvent. What do I mean by the minimum amount? What I mean is that you're not just going to boil up a bunch of solvent and then just dump it in there. You're going to add it carefully so that you just get everything into solution. Okay, so here is your solution right here. So now these molecules that were at this low free energy state are at a higher free energy state because they're all separated by solvent, right? There's solvent in between all of these particles, whereas before, all the particles were packed tightly together in this crystal lattice. So what happens is, as or when the uh, molecules reach the higher free energy state, you let the solvent or the solution cool slowly so that the crystal lattice can form slowly. And if it forms slowly, you maximize the interactions between the organic molecules in the solid. And if you have impurities, they're just going to fall off the face of the crystal. They're not going to bind to the newly formed crystal lattice. Okay? So that's the whole theory about recrystallization, right? You're ending up with something that's at lower free energy, something that's more stable than it was at the beginning, right? Okay. Anyhow, again, once it's cooled to room temperature, you're going to cool it in an ice bath so that you can be sure to get the maximum amount of solid out of there, right? You're going to lower the solubility of your desired product, or your desired compound. Um, in the solvent as much as possible. All right. Then, if you're wondering, how do I get this out of here? Well, you just filter it off. All right. You're going to filter, and your solid is going to end up in your funnel. Okay. This is the funnel. This is the solid. And then this is what we call the filtrate, which is just your solvent plus the impurities that are left behind. Okay. So you can see that. The crystallization is really powerful if it enables you to take an impure organic compound and end up with a pure compound. All right, so let's talk about experiment 3.4 part A because I told you that we're going to use historical data 
um, from this lab. So student uh, data from a few semesters ago. In the past, students tried 3.48 using the same five solvents that I mentioned a few minutes ago, hexane, toluene, acetone, ethanol, and water. And what they did is they used test tubes and small amounts of solvent and solute to determine the solubility of these compounds in each one of these solvents. So for example, the students took, they did a lot of experiments here. They took transstilbene, they checked its solubility in hexane, they checked it in toluene, they checked it in acetone, they checked it in ethanol, they checked it in water. They did the same thing for the 9-fluoronone and they did the same thing for the benzoic acid. Now, of course, they didn't do all 15 maybe, but I think we got each one of them to do five maybe. And then we pulled the data and we put it up on the board, okay? So what you're gonna do at the start of the lab is we're gonna have that data up on the board and we're gonna discuss it as a class and decide what the best course of action will be um, depending on which solid you're starting with. Here is that solubility table. So you don't have to wait to come to the lab. This is the data right here, okay? So for example, if we just look at, let's say, 9-fluoronone, you can see that in hexane, it was insoluble in cold hexane, insoluble in hot hexane. In toluene, it was soluble in both cold and hot. In acetone, the P means partially soluble, and it was soluble in hot. And here we had partially soluble and soluble again. And here we had completely insoluble in water, no matter what the situation. Now, you can probably guess what the answer is right away, because we're looking for solvents in which the solid is going to be insoluble at the cold temperature and soluble at a hot temperature. And if you look for each one of these, there's only one solvent that fits the bill for each one of them. Okay? So, in other words, out of all five of these solvents, there's only three of them that are going to get used. All right. So, again, when you walk into the lab, you're going to be assigned one of these solid compounds. You're going to put all three of these in your reagent table. And you're also going to put all five of the solvents in your reagent table. Again, like I said, you want to evaluate what are the polarities of these compounds. You want to look at the melting points of these compounds because you're going to check the purity of your recrystallized product by melting point. Be sure to put this information in your table of reagents. Then again, using that data table provided, and it's also in the slides here, you're going to select the appropriate solvent. You can probably figure out which solvent is best for each one and why before you even show up to the lab. Remember, in your reagent table, I want you to evaluate these compounds in terms of their polarities. Be sure to include not their melting points, but rather their, I should say, boiling points. It's a copy paste error. And be sure to include that in there. The reason the boiling point is important is because you're going to be boiling at least one of these solvents in the lab, so you'll need to know what its boiling point is for the appropriate hot plate setting. All right, so what are you going to do? Well, when you're writing up your procedure, remember to read the procedure that's in our lab manual, but what I have written on the slides will be the ultimate authority, and there is a, a couple of slight changes here. Okay. I think, and I, I have to go back and look, I don't read the lab manual again and again every semester after semester, but I think that the lab manual might say something like take 200 milligrams of the compound, but all you're going to take is 100 milligrams plus or minus 10 milligrams. So anywhere between 90 to 110 milligrams of your assigned solid, and you're going to put it into a 25 mil Erlenmeyer flask, not a beaker. Right? An Erlenmeyer flask has a conical shape, and a beaker has a shape like this. So if we're boiling a solvent in a beaker or an Erlenmeyer flask, it should be abundantly clear why it would be better to boil a solvent in an Erlenmeyer flask, which has the conical shape, compared to a beaker, which has a more cylindrical or open shape. All right. Now, when you're boiling something in the organic laboratory, you don't just uh, put it on the stove like you do some water at home and just press boil or press, you know, turn on the heat and let it rip, right? Let it rip potato chip. Well, in organic chemistry, we let it rip with a boiling chip or a boiling stick. Now, you can use one or the other. Personally, I don't like boiling chips, okay? I'm a big fan of the boiling stick, okay? I just am. Again, your instructor will have both of them on the instructor table, and you can choose whichever one you want. 
but you don't need both, just like you don't need to wear a belt and suspenders simultaneously. So you're going to add the boiling solvent with the pasture pipette. Um, you keep adding little increments of hot boiling solvent until all of your solid is dissolved. Now, it might be a knee-jerk reaction to say, well, I'll just add a drop at a time, and then eventually it's going to go into solution. The problem with adding little drops at a time is that the vapor pressure of the solvent is going to be high enough that it'll evaporate faster than you can add it drop-wise. So you kind of have to add like little bits at a time, okay? All right, so maybe, you know, uh, 20 drops or 50 drops at a time or something like that. Okay, now again, you're trying to dissolve your solid. What would you want to do if you want to solve, dissolve it? I would stir it, okay? So I would swirl it or move it around, and I would not take it off the hot plate, right? Because if you take it off the hot plate, that's going to lower the temperature of the solvent, which will lower the solubility of your solid or your solute in that solvent, okay? Once your solid is completely dissolved, all you have to do is take the Erlenmeyer flask off of the hot plate, you put it aside, you do not touch it. You just look at it, okay? It won't take long. It will take maybe five, 10 minutes maximum for the crystals to come out. Once the flask, the Erlenmeyer, um, the Erlenmeyer is cool and no more crystals seem to be growing, then you can put the Erlenmeyer flask in an ice bath, leave it there for five or 10 minutes, and then you're going to filter off your product using a Buchner funnel. What would you use to wet your filter paper? Well, I would use some of the cold solvent that I use to recrystallize it. Why cold? Because if I put warm, then it's going to dissolve some of the solid that I pour on, onto the, the filter. All right. Um, so you put all the crystals into the Buchner funnel. Make sure the vacuum is on full blast. Okay. This is one of those rare instances in life where you can turn a faucet all the way open or turn a tap all the way open. If there's any crystals left behind in your Erlenmeyer flask, use your metal spatula to scrape them out. Then you wash them with a little bit of cold solvent, okay, so that they don't dissolve. You can fluff them with your spatula, and then you let them sit for 15 minutes, after which you can take the melting point. Here are some pictures that were taken by a colleague of mine a number of semesters ago showing the art of recrystallization. So, the reason why you want to know the boiling point of all the solvents is because you want to have the hot plate setting to around one and a half times the boiling point of your solvent. So you can see that this is the boiling stick right here. The chemist has some solvent in an Erlenmeyer flask and he's waiting for it to boil. Once it has begun to boil, you can take it and move it to the back corner, which is usually a little bit cooler, not much, but maybe a, a degree or something, or half a degree, you can put it in the back. Then you take your solid in your Erlenmeyer flask, and you're going to use the pasture pipette to add hot boiling solvent, that's what he's doing here, to solubilize, dissolve the solid. Okay, after it's completely dissolved, the chemist takes it from the hot plate and puts it on on the bench in the fume hood and just lets it sit and lets it cool slowly. Do not touch it. Crystals will form. Okay. If they don't, go see your instructor, your lab instructor, and she or he will help you decide what your next step should be. After the crystals have come out and the Erlenmeyer flask is cool, you can put it in an ice bath, which is made of about a quarter water and three quarters ice. Let it sit in that ice bath for a few minutes, maybe five minutes or so. Now, I don't like the way this person did it here. Um, it's probably okay. I can't really tell by the angle. But you want to put it in a small enough beaker so that the Erlenmeyer flask can't tip over. Because if it tips over, then you're what we call SOL, because this will be later on in the lab. Where do you get the filter paper for your Buchner funnel? Remember I told you that the Buchner funnel has a kind of conical shape? Like this, it also has a rubber, a rubber um, stopper that's got a hole in it that's on it. Well, the filter paper that you're going to put in there, you need to cut it yourself. Okay, so this is a giant filter paper here, and you're going to take a little tiny cork, trace around it with a pencil, and cut that out. This is why 
during the TLC lab, we told you to keep your little scrap that was left over from your half moon. If you have that, you can cut many filter papers out of that piece of filter paper that's left over. The setting up the Hirsch funnel is something that needs to be learned. Here's the Hirsch funnel on a vacuum flask. This is a vacuum flask right here. You have one in your drawer. You can see that the scientists clamp the Erlenmeyer or the vacuum flask with a three finger clamp as the Buchner funnel here with the filter paper in there. And the vacuum hose is attached to what's called a trap. It's called a trap. Now, the reason for a vacuum trap is so that if you had excess filtrate in here, and if you had the vacuum on, that the excess filtrate would end up in the trap and not in the university's vacuum line, which is very expensive to repair if some solvent was to go in there. Okay. Now, in my lab, I'm going to set up an example of a trap with the three fingered clamp so that my students will have that to look at. And I'll only do that at one time because we'll use the same setup in organic chemistry too whenever we need to filter something. Be sure that you use a ring stand and the three finger clamp okay, to support your vacuum flask with your Hirsch funnel. If you don't, it's gonna fall over and you're gonna lose your crystals. Now, also filtering off crystals is something that takes some practice, you're only gonna get one chance at it. And um, you're in, you can ask your instructor for some tips because it's best to try to pour them all in there at once, okay? Now you don't wanna throw them in there, but you wanna pour them in fast enough that you get most of the solid out of there so that you can minimize the scraping that you have to do to get the remainder of the crystals in there. Again, once all of the crystals are in there, you're gonna let them sit under the vacuum as strong as it can go. You open it up all the way for about 15 minutes, okay? Then you're gonna fluff and dry the crystals with your spatula. Well, after that, and there's some things that are left out of here, then once they're dry and you've taken the melting point, you're gonna put them in a vial. So everybody has a couple of vials in their drawer, which you're gonna put a label. And on there, you're gonna put your name, okay? Legibly, you're gonna write the name of the product that you crystallized, let's say I did benzoic acid, for example, and you're going to put experiment, I don't know, you can put experiment 3.4D, since that's the part you did to do the recrystallization. Okay? All right. Well, let's talk about what you need to prepare before you come to the lab. Again, there's some reading involved in this one, a little more than there has been in previous labs. Be sure to go through all the experimental and read a lot of technique gap. Parts that are important are highlighted here, okay? It's important that you read this. If you don't, it will become abundantly clear when you start asking us questions that you should know the answer to by reading the technique F. You don't buy the textbook just to make your office look good. It's full of useful information. Okay, again, you're gonna recrystallize your assigned solid. The name of your assigned solid will be on your fume hood sash. You're gonna weigh out anywhere between 90 to 110 millimeter, milligrams of your compound in an Erlenmeyer flask at hot boiling solvent so that you dissolve all of your solid. You're gonna cool it first at room temperature. Then once cooling has ceased, you put it in ice for five minutes. You filter off the crystals in your Buchner funnel. You wash them with cold solvent so as not to dissolve any of the crystals. Then you're gonna fluff them, let them dry for 15 minutes, take a melting point, put them in a vial, and then you're gonna have um, a particular place where you're gonna be able to put your crystals on the shelf. And the reason why you need to put your crystals on the shelf is because the crystals are graded. Mr. Mayor and I will grade the quality of the crystal. All right, so make sure you have a header on your first page with a complete title for both parts. After that, you can shorten the title if you wish to do so. Your purpose should just be a few sentences just detailing what you're doing in the experiment. The questions you want to ask yourself are, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? And how are you isolating the product? Well, we're isolating the product by the crystallization and we're characterizing it or determining that it's the correct compound 
by melting point. What else? You need to have your table of reagents with a source, which can just be the UCCS chemical list, if that's what you're using. You have to have all five liquids and all three solids. Be sure to put the name, molecular weight, and the formula for structures, melting points for the solids, boiling points for the liquids. Remember, I want you to rank the solvents in terms of their polarity. For those, there's five. So you'll want to go from most polar to least polar, and you can put intermediate polarity or whatever. Okay. Then you also want to rank the solvents in terms of their polarity. I told you the easiest, or sorry, the solids, the easiest way to do that is to look at their structures and determine or the, determine whether they're polar, slightly polar or polar. Uh, there we go. Make sure you put make a separate safety table for all eight of the solids and liquids. Procedure, make sure to use the two column format, right? You take your page, you start in a new page, you put procedure, okay? It's split. On this side, you have observations, and there should be plenty of cool observations to make when you're doing a recrystallization. Be sure to record your assigned solid. That would be a major faux pas if you were to leave that out. Be sure to record the approximate volume of the solvent that you used for the recrystallization. This is going to kind of have to be your best guess because you're probably not going to you're not going to measure it using a graduated cylinder or anything like that. And then you're going to take the melting point of the recrystallized solid. In previous semesters, we allowed our students to take their melting points outside of class time, but due to a global pandemic, we're going to have to scratch this out. You have to take the melting point. You got to do this in class. So you got to do this in the lab. Okay, you got to get that done before you leave. Trust me, there is time. Okay, um, again, just some small procedural changes. You're going to choose the best solvent from the table, and the quantity that you're going to use is around 100 milligrams, plus or minus 10 milligrams. Again, your recrystallized sample, you're going to put that in a vial with the experiment name, your name. You should put your lab section too, so 010 or whatever. Um, there you go, the name of the compound that you recrystallized. And we will deduct points if it's filled out in such a way that we cannot figure out what the heck is going on. Okay, so just make it abundantly clear. Uh, and we will provide labels, so don't worry about that. Uh, then you're going to store them on the shelf behind the whiteboard. We'll show you exactly where to put them, so you won't be guessing. Then Mr. Mayor and I will evaluate the samples in terms of their yield and quality. We will also check some of them, not all of them, okay, um, for their melting points. Okay, after the lab, you make sure that you clean your bench in the hood area. Make sure everything's clean. Be sure to wipe off your bench tops with the disinfectant. And then the calculations for this one are pretty short. You calculate your percent recovery, not a percent yield because you're not making anything, but you want to calculate how much you recover of the recrystallized product. The formula for percent recovery is the mass of the recrystallized product divided by the mass of what you started with, the impure product multiplied by 100%, okay? There we go. And there you go. And the data sheet, um, please type out the data sheet. Um, if you choose to handwrite it, make sure it's very legible, but we much prefer if you type it out. All right. There are some pitfalls that you can run into during the lab, a few of them. You could spill your experiment or things like that. Um, now, I'm not going to answer these questions right now because it's not going to apply to hopefully nobody. But um, if you end up, you know, caught between a rock and a hard place in the lab, you can ask your instructor and she or he can help you um, decide what the best course of action would be. But I can tell you that the best, the number one course of action in this lab would be to come prepared. If you know what you're going to do ahead of time, it makes the lab a lot more enjoyable and much simpler. Okay, so be sure you know what to do when you step into the lab. If you step into the lab and you start having to reread your procedure 10 times or wishing that you had the, you know, shop style manual with you, it will be a difficult lab. So come prepared and you will be able to finish in the allotted amount of time. All right, let's take a look at the data sheet. Here it is right here. 
this is the data sheet. It's pretty short. You're going to put in the assigned compound. So let's say you had benzoic acid, the um, solvent that you selected, the mass of the product, or the mass of the uh, crystals that you recovered. Um, this shouldn't say mass of product. I, I'm going to change that. I'll put mass of mass of compound for a crystallization because it's not it's because you guys didn't make anything. I guess technically it is a product. Anyhow, then the mass that you recovered, calculate the percent recovery. We'll give you a grade um, with respect to your quality. You want to show the, the calculation for the percent recovery of the compound. And then the last part is to summarize your experiment in a few paragraphs. Why did you select the, the crystallization solvent you did? It was insoluble. My, my solid was insoluble at cold temperature. It was soluble at hot temperature. Okay, what can you say about the efficiency? Um, and what are some experimental errors that you might have encountered along the way? All right, that just about summarizes it all. Give me a second here. So a student asked me, how much solvent do we use? Can anybody answer that? How much solvent would we use? Can anybody answer that? OK, well, there's no volume that I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you add 5 milliliters, add 10 milliliters, add 20 milliliters. There's no volume that I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. What you add is the minimum amount to dissolve your solid. So you keep adding it, the hot boiling solvent, until all of the solid is dissolved. Once it's dissolved, that was the right amount. And depending on the compound, the amount will differ. Depending on the amount of compound, the amount will differ, okay? Also, depending on how quickly you do it, the amount is gonna differ. If somebody is really slow at it, well, they're gonna be fighting against the vapor pressure of the compound, which is gonna be boiling off while they're heating it, right? If somebody works uh, quicker, then they're probably going to be able to get away with using less because they won't be fighting as much against the solvent that's being evaporated. And so again, you want to add the minimum amount. Now, there's a there's a famous book that deals with procedures in organic chemistry lab, and the famous statement from that book is, you add solvent until you reach the point of incipient turbidity. And what that means is you basically add hot boiling solvent until you have a cloudy, uh, suspension and then if you add just one more drop poof, it goes into solution then you know you've added the bare minimum but the answer is you want to put in the minimum amount of solvent are there any other questions it doesn't mean that you're not going to write down how much you're still going to write down an estimate of how much you put in okay on the side of the Erlenmeyer flask right there are gradations on the side of the Erlenmeyer flask. They can only be read to the one's place, and they're probably not that accurate since it's just stamped on the side, but it should give you an idea, a ballpark idea of how much you added, okay? We're not gonna cut you down if you wrote, uh, I put in 12 milliliters of solvent and we think it took 13. No, we just want you to know that it took you, let's say seven milliliters instead of you know 70 or something like that. Because a major pitfall that students run into in this lab, I would say, is if you add too much solvent. That is one of the major problems you can run into. Add too much solvent. And depending on which solvent you have, it will determine the size of your headache. So if you had hexanes as your solvent, and you add too much by accident, if you just go for it and start throwing solvent in there and you just add too much because you didn't read the lab or you didn't understand what you're supposed to do, which is add the minimum amount of solvent, you just throw a whole shitload in there. What's gonna happen is you're gonna have way too much and then if you cool it, well, it's still gonna stay in solution. So then the only option is to boil the solvent off. And so if you have something like hexane, which is a high vapor pressure, it's going to boil off quickly. But if you have something like water, it's a real PITA. It's going to take a long time to boil that off. Okay? So the minimum.
minimum amount of hot salt. All right, any other questions? 